Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Tonight, we are thrilled to present a collaboration, a wonderful partnership with the Italian Cultural Institute of San Francisco. Tonight, we will watch the first of a two-part series. So please join us for part two on Wednesday, August 18th, Virtual Wednesdays right here on YouTube at 5 p.m. Tonight's program celebrates the amazing exhibition, Last Supper in Pompeii, From the Table to the Grave, on view at the Legion of Honor until August 29th. Please join me in welcoming Professor Giovanni De Pasquale. Please see our website for his incredibly long list of accolades. But tonight, Professor Pasquale joins us to talk about the historical significance and development of wine. We will explore the importance of the wild grape vine as a fundamental step in the history of agriculture and civilization. This collaboration has been an honor. Please join me in welcoming Anna Maria Di Giorgio, the director of the Italian Cultural Institute of San Francisco. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anna Maria Di Giorgio, and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in San Francisco. I am very honored to be here today introducing the first part of this virtual Wednesday webinar on art, science, and mythology of wine in ancient Mediterranean cultures with Professor Giovanni Di Pasquale uh, from uh, Museo Galileo Galilei in Florence. Professor Di Pasquale, allow me to thank you very much once again for accepting our invitation. And please allow me also to thank uh, especially Rene Dreyfus uh, and Francesca D'Alessio from Museum Legion of Honor for organizing this amazing series uh, of Virtual Wednesday. Um, the second part of this presentation will be streamed on Wednesday, August 18th, because the history is very long from the ancient Near East to Etruria, Rome, and the vineyards of Pompeii. Uh, this presentation is a journey about millenniums of history, the cultural and religious spaces, the geographic diffusion of viticulture, the agricultural technologies employed, uh, and consumption of wine. This uh, program is in support of the exhibition Last Supper in Pompeii from Tables to the Grave at the Legion of Honor Museums uh, in partnership with the Italian, Consulate, with Italian Cultural Institute San Francisco and under the patronage of the Italian Consulate General in San Francisco. I hope you'll enjoy this uh, webinar and please stay safe. Uh, have a nice summer and I hope to see you back again soon in person at the Italian Cultural Institute. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this, this um, talk is about wine and the origin of uh, the civilization of wine in our Mediterranean culture, in the classical civilization. And wine belongs to the history of humanity and since the most remote antiquity. Uh, it's an incredible story dealing in part with nature and in part with human mankind because the, vi the vine is a product of nature but wine is a product of human skill. And it's a, an incredible element passing through every uh, side of our life with a lot of symbolic meanings that uh, people began to drink, not because they, they felt thirsty, thirst, but because it's a moment of meeting with other people, uh, an invitation to conversation, to share thoughts, ideas, culture, and friendship. So, um, moreover, wine has a strong relation with medical properties. The Greek doctors in antiquity knew these properties very well, and we know that uh, there is a part of medical literature in antiquity that divides the remedies of water from the remedies of wine. And this is something really interesting and uh, actual too, because, for example, we know that wine has medical properties has been demonstrated today in France where people eat uh, a lot of butter and foyer grass and it has been demonstrated that wine helped them don't to develop a high level of 
cholesterol in the blood. So it's a really interesting story that we could follow uh, touching many different fields in our uh, civilization. And it is really interesting to underline that the vineyards together with the olive oil trees are the fundamental elements of the Mediterranean landscape. When we talk of the typical Mediterranean landscape today, we know for sure that this is something related to the diffusion of vineyards and olive oil trees. And um, how, so if we want to look for the real beginning of the story related to the vine and the vineyard, we have to consider the very well-known story of the universal flood and Noah. So uh, everybody knows that according to our tradition, after surviving the universal flood, according to the story, Noah plants and va uh, vineyard, that is not necessary to survive. And it is really interesting to, to read the very severe father of the church command. So for example, St. Ambrose will say that Noah was right in uh, planting a vineyard, even if he get drunk immediately, because I quote, God's mercy would have provided for the necessary food to survive but not for the wine. And it is really interesting to consider that uh, a vineyard, a grape harvest, are the beginning of the new story of humanity after the flood. And something is, is true in this story, because as far as we know, the archeologist has demonstrated that the area between the Ararat mountain the Caucasus region, the Zagros mountain, so ancient Near East, is credited to be the region where for the first time the domestication of the grape happened, the domestication of the vine happened. And as a matter of fact, the archeologists have found at the base of the Caucasus mountain, the remains, of a very ancient wine that was uh, drunk from the people living in that area. It is a very interesting area because the Caucasus regions, what is today Georgia, uh, is the place where the anthropologists have found the remains of communities belonging to 1,800,000 years ago. And this is a very interesting event because information because we have the remains of hominids, we have the domestication of the vine from Vitis sylvestris to domesticated plant. We have containers where we know for sure that a great Jewish, it's very complicated to call uh, this wine, in any case was a great Jais, was inside these containers. I show you this one, and in the national from the National Museum in Tbilisi, in Georgia. This is one of the oldest containers related to the beginning of the story. As a matter of fact, this land is a very important country in the history of classical civilization because this is the land that the Greeks knew. Uh, to have a very important amount of precious metals. So this is the land related to the story of Jason and the Argonauts. And this is the, the region where we have your know, minutes. And this is a place where today too, we have people producing wine following the old tradition from this land. So keeping the wine inside clay enormous containers inside the ground. And together with the origin of civilization related to the diffusion of agriculture in this part of the, of the, of the Mediterranean basin, we find the dissemination of the wine. 
so the wine was traveling around the rivers of Mesopotamia, even if Mesopotamia was the land of beer and barley, we know that the kings and the queens were drinking wine in Mesopotamia. There was an important commercial activity related to uh, wine commerce. And of course, we have wine in Egypt where the area all around the River Nile Delta was the landscape, was a landscape made of fantastic vineyards. And we know that the archaeologists have found an incredible amount of amphora, amphoras from Phoenicia, Palestina, uh, that is the land where, according to the ancient sources, uh, there was more wine than water. And there was an incredible commerce with the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. In Egypt, too, wine, of course, was a drink not to, for everybody, but for pharaohs, gods. It's really interesting the presence of representations, images like this, where we have a deposit of wine, of amphoras containing wine. This is a really interesting information. For example, we know that uh, the pharaoh Scorpio I, he was buried together with 700 amphora wine because uh, he felt sure that he needed this wine to drink it with the gods in his afterlife. Uh, here is a very interesting painting from the uh, Egyptian Museum in Turin, Italy. Uh, top of the painting, it's possible to see two workers tasting the quality of wine. Here are two amphoras, and they are using uh, a straw to test the quality of, of wine. And of course, in the history of wine, Italy and Etruria play a fundamental role. First of all, due to the presence of a very good meteorological situation, due to the presence of the, the sea, and the archaeologists have told us that in this area there is a very particular situation because we have vineyards going back to the 17th century before Christ. And these vineyards were part of the Etruscan landscape before the building and the foundation and building of the Etruscan towns. So this is a very interesting information that the archaeologists give us, thanks to the molecular analysis of organic remains that can be found in the archaeological site. And this is an important information telling us something about the peculiarity of the landscape of what was Etruria at the time, Etruria the land between the two rivers, the Arno River that we have here in Florence, and the Tiber River, the Tiber River in Rome. And of course, so the Etruscan people began to produce a high quality wine because molecular analysis tell us that here for the first time we find uh, tempted attempts to cross different kinds of vines. So, for example, we have Etruscan old vineyards that have been crossed with vineyards with vines from Sicily. So, this is a very interesting information that uh, we can know thanks to the archaeobotanical analysis that today have an increasing importance when we talk of archaeology concerning the landscape and the economy of the places we want to understand in a better way. The Etruscan people were responsible for the diffusion of what is going to become the typical container with a very long-lasting story, the amphora that you see here the shape of the amphora will change many times. But as a matter of fact, so the amphora 
is going to have, starting from now, a long-lasting story as the favorite container to transport and to preserve wine. So it is really interesting to consider the, the Etruscan uh, use, and the Romans were really uh, astonished concerning this information because according to the literary sources, the Etruscan high classes used to eat twice a day, sitting at the table, and above all, they used to admit women to the banquet. That's something that in Greece was strictly reserved to men, and in Rome for a long time, women will not be allowed to drink wine together with uh, the men of the family. They could drink wine um, not in front of the other people. So this is something that was really incredible considering when the Roman and the Greek people were thinking of the Etruscan habit. And a typical representation of the high classes Etruscan, of the Etruscan society, is, are the um, leaves of sarcophagus, like the one that you see here, where you have an elderly aristocrat in a half reclining position. You see there is a garland around his neck. Uh, maybe you can see there is a big ring in one finger of his left hand. And here there is a patera that is a typical wine container. So this is a typical representation of the opulent aristocrat from the Etruscan society appreciating the production and consumption of wine, not by chance. Etruscan tom, toms were filled with vases to con related to the consumption of wine because they felt sure they needed in the life after death. The Greek world is responsible for a uh, very important mass production of wine for commerce. This is a from the vase, the painted vase that you see here. Uh, is a fantastic document that is perfect relating to the story we are telling today. Here is the god Dionysus exporting a vine towards new lands. So we have to consider that the Mediterranean Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, when the Mediterranean Sea was open to navigation from April to October, a lot of boats, ships, cargoes were traveling from east to west, transporting uh, goods, wine, olive oil, bronzes, statues, ideas and knowledge. So the vine was one of the most common objects transported through the Mediterranean basin and not by chance. There is a um, really interesting information that we have got in recent years thanks to the analysis of the DNA from the organic remains of vines and we have seen that 78 uh, different kinds of vines that we know today in Italy have a very ancient origin and remind us that this is a Mediterranean story belonging to the whole classical civilization. And the Greeks were responsible, responsible for disseminating vineyards in the southern part of Italy when the people moved to, for the foundation of new places, new cities. They used to bring, to bring with them the plant of the vine. Not by chance, the southern part of Italy, according to the Greek authors, was Enotria. Enotria means the land of wine, vineyards and the land of wine. There was an incredible mass production and it is really interesting that what we see now is the appearance of a problematic relationship between the Etruscan people 
producing and trying to commerce wine in the whole Mediterranean basin and the Greek cities in the southern part of Italy trying to stop the Etruscan commerce of wine. And as a matter of fact, we see now the Etruscan people looking for new areas to disseminate, to open their commerce. And this is the beginning of a new, very interesting relationship, commercial relationship between the Etruscan people and the southern part of France. While the Greek are creating their fantastic vineyards in the southern part of Italy and in Sicily, there is a high class production of wine, above all in the Greek islands disseminated in the Aegean Sea. And as a matter of fact, those um, wine will have an incredible long lasting reputation in, uh, <clears throat> in the Roman time, even during the Roman imperial age. What is really interesting to us is that according to the Greek culture, when the Greek were in front of something that they considered to be very important, they used to look for a first inventor. So when thinking to the origin of wine diffusion of the cultivation of the vine, they ask it themselves, what is the origin of the story? So, so here we have a different story from the Noah Universal Flood. Here we have the story of Dionysus, the god responsible for the diffusion of wine, and the story, these are two different stories, and the story related to the origin of the plant of the vine. The origin of the vine is a really interesting story related to a shepherd, uh, Oresteus. He was walking together with his dog. His dog was pregnant and his dog gave birth to a stump. So Oresteus wanted to bury it, but immediately from this stump appeared a new plant never seen before, a vine. So the name of that dog was Sirius, later to become a constellation, the brightest star in the sky. The Greek poet Hesiodus, in the, his works and days, knows very well that when he says, when you see the star Sirius in the sky, it's time to cut the grapes branches and to bring that home. So it's time for the harvesting of the vineyard. And this is the beginning of the story related to the star, to the, to the plant. But the second part of the story needs the presence of a God teaching humanity to drink. Here we have the appearance of Dionysus, and he's the unique Greek god to die. Dionysus dies every, every year, and he reappears the following year. The death of Dionysus is a, has a symbolic meaning, is the um, sacrifice of the, the plant of the vine when the farmers cut the bunches and are ready for harvesting the grapes. So this is a sacrifice that is necessary to produce wine. Dionysus is responsible for the dissemination of wine and above all, to teach humanity to drink. Greek people knows very well that there are civilization where there are places where people never learn to drink wine. The Persians, for example, according to the Greek, they are not capable of, drink, of drinking wine because they never learn how to drink wine. 
So wine in the Greek civilization becomes a urban phenomenon. Here we have images related to the myth of Dionysus. So the wine, the drinking of wine, is a urban phenomenon that must be teached. We, we, we have to teach the people how to drink wine. Not by chance, the Greeks are responsible for the invention of the symposium. The symposium <clears throat> is an incredible invention, is a, like a private drinking party. And from the fifth century BC, uh, we have the diffusion of the symposium as a urban phenomenon. Uh, for example, we have to consider that in Plato, the philosopher Plato, uh, when thinking on <clears throat> the ideal society, the ideal city, the ideal town, the ideal town, according to Plato, was made in the shape of a crater. The crater is the container that you see here in this slide, and is the vase where they had to mix, in a, according to a perfect proportion, wine and water. To teach the people how to drink is, is an actual uh, message, and is a message that the Greeks knew very well because they had a lot of examples from the Daily Chronicle uh, related to young people making uh, excesses of various kind uh, due to the excess of wine drinking. So the symposium is a fantastic invention uh, that is uh, a perfect mirror of the culture of the Greek civilization related to the diffusion, dissemination of wine. So you have to consider a group of people meeting themselves at the home of one of them and deciding to discuss the topic of the day, to discuss together, and they start drinking, eating, playing, and if you drink too much wine, you remain within the walls of the house where you are. So this is a very interesting message. And this is something that we will find in Rome too. The symposium will be the convivium in Rome. And Rome was responsible for an incredible, we could say today, uh, industrial product mass production of wine in Italy and in the regions around Italy. Here you have, you can read Pliny the Elder writing the middle half of the first century AD that uh, is uh, saying, according to him, that Italy is the most important place in the Mediterranean area concerning uh, the production of wine and the presence of vineyards. The people living in Rome had at their disposal every kind of food and every kind of wine, of course, the high classes, <clears throat> coming from every part of the world. And what is really interesting to consider is that the analysis of the archaeologists demonstrated that enormous big vineyards for a mass production, for example, for soldiers, uh, stay close to little vineyards for a high-class wine production. The, the Roman people, the Italian people, had a passion for, for some of the Greek wines from the Greek island, Kos, Chios, Rhodes, uh, were places where the Greek were involved in a high class wine production. But the Greek, the Roman people were really fond of a series of Italian wines. The, the most important was the Falernian. The Falernian wine was considered the king of the Italian wine, the favorite. 
capable of reaching an incredible cost, so not for everybody. The Italian uh, landscape saw an incredible event, if you look at the next slide, Starting from the second and the third century AD, we have the transportation of wine through uh, wine skin made of leather and wooden barrels. So we have amphoras, like the one that you see in this image, traveling across the Mediterranean Sea. Together, starting from the second century, together with wooden barrels. This is an incredible event. So, and this is the beginning of the end of the story for the amphora as the most important container. Of course, we could tell a lot of things about the consumption and drinking of wine in Rome. There, is, uh, there are very well-known stories, for example, for example, the orator Hortensius, he was said to have 10,000 jars of excellent wine into his house. Or there was a very well known about the wine produced in the year 121 before Christ that was said to be in absolute the best existing wine in Rome that was uh, still available in the first century A.B. of the current era, reaching an incredible cost. In the very well-known uh, Trimalcione, Trimalcio dinner, the, the literary work written by Petronius, at a certain moment, uh, the owner of the house um, is ready to give to his friends an amphora of this precious wine to drink it to get together. And we know that in Rome, poets like Horace and Marshall were wine drinkers and admirers of wine. Horace was drinking very important wines, while Marshall is responsible for writing fantastic verses that we can still read today, these verses are written against the host in the taverns in Rome, providing a bad quality wine, a uh, wine uh, with a uh, too elevated amount of water. So we have, if we read the literary sources, a very interesting picture where we can see the existence of high class wines and very poor wine. Thank you so much to Professor Giovanni Di Pasquale and Anna Maria Di Giorgio for this wonderful conversation. And of course, thank you to the Italian Cultural Institute of San Francisco. It is always a pleasure to partner with you. Please join us for part two of this series on August 18th when Professor Pasquale is joined with our distinguished curator, our curator in charge of ancient art and interpretation, Renee Dreyfus. Thank you so much for supporting Virtual Wednesdays, and we hope to see you next week.